Hello students. Today I am going to be talking about chapter one and for those of you who like having a bit of narration with the slides, it's a bit more like having me in class, I am going to go through some of the slides. I'm probably not going to cover every single thing on every little slide, but this will give you a good introduction to the course and for those of you who may not want to uh, read through every little thing, this will give you kind of the important stuff that you need to know. So let me go into my slideshow and we will begin. Yeah, there we go. So there it is. All right, so I'm going to talk first about a little bit about the most important geographic feature of ancient Egypt, which was the Nile River. And the Nile is the world's longest river. Uh, it has several tributaries, a white Nile, Nile that originates in Uganda, a blue Nile that originates in Ethiopia. And the thing that made the Nile so important to the Egyptians is, of course, Everything around them was desert except for all around the Nile River, and it flooded twice a year. They called it the inundation, and that was very vital to the lives of the ancient Egyptians because after the flood, when the Nile would recede back into its banks, there would be a um, silt, a black fertile silt, and they would plant their crops in that silt. And that's where we get the name Kemet, which is what the ancient Egyptians actually called uh, ancient Egypt. And uh, they called the areas around the desert, Desheret, which means the red land. So you have the black land and the red land. And the ancient Egyptians divided that into two parts. So upper Egypt and lower Egypt. Upper Egypt is actually Desheret. It is the su southern part of the country. Uh, it's the area where there's more desert. Uh, lower Egypt is northern Egypt. That is Kemet. That is where uh, the Nile spreads out into lots of little um not tributaries, but into a little delta into the Mediterranean Ocean, and that is northern Egypt. And another thing you will notice about Egyptian history is it's divided into distinct periods. You may have heard the terms the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, the New Kingdom, uh, but there's some periods around that as well. So there's a whole pre-dynastic period from about 5000 to 2920 BC. And during this period, uh, this was a period before a major climate change had taken place in the region. It was starting to happen. Um, the Sahara originally had been a well fertile old uh, well uh, watered landscape they were able to plant crops all kinds of things all throughout that region and climate change began happening desertification began happening and so people who were living in northern Africa during that those periods found out into other parts of Africa and so a large part of them became the people who would uh, become the ancient Egyptians. So that's that whole pre-dynastic period, 5000 to 2920 BC. Early dynastic period is when Egypt starts to be unified. Um, up until this point, there were all kinds of little kingdoms up and down the Nile, each with their own, you know, kings and so forth. And slowly over time, Egypt became to be unified. And they generally talk about the unification of Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt together. So that is 2920 to 2649 BC. We talk about dynasties throughout Egyptian history. You'll hear Dynasty 0, Dynasty 1, all the way up to Dynasty 31. One. And the reason for this is every time there's a new ruling family, that's the new dynasty. Uh, in the Old Kingdom, we have 2649 to 2134 BC. That's when the Great Pyramids were built. And then we have a period of disruption. Uh, there's three distinct periods of disruption in Egyptian history, and these are periods of time in which Egypt was either uh, disunified, there was civil war going on, or uh, invaders had come in and were ruling Egypt. So we have, and we'll talk more about each of those individually as we go on. But the first intermediate period was from 2134 to 2040 BC. And then after that came the Middle Kingdom. Egypt is unified again from 2040 to 1640 BC. And then another period of disruption, 1640 to 1532 BC. Uh, and then unification again, the New Kingdom, 1550 to 1070 BC. And a lot of Egyptian histories actually end with that, which is 
silly because there's so much more that happens. Um, we have a third intermediate period after that in which um, actually the, the Persians came in and were ruling Egypt and they were not well thought of. And what actually happened, uh, this is very important, we talk about this in my African art class, um, the 25th dynasty rises from the south, from Nubia, which is just south of Egypt. And they come and they rule all of Egypt. That's Dynasty 25 in the late period. And then after that, we have the Greco-Roman period in which um, Alexander the Great from Macedonia comes in. He was originally Greek. And so he appoints the Ptolemies to rule in his stead in that area. And they ruled for quite some time from 332 to uh, AD 395. And Cleopatra, actually more around AD 33, I want to say. Um, but Romans were ruling Egypt up until about 395 uh, AD after Cleopatra died. I talked about her a little bit um, af um, last week. So I'm going to move on because I'm I'm fading into babbling. And here we have the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. And this is extremely important. This happened in 1799. And it was discovered by the French uh, during this period in the 18th century. The French and the British were kind of going up against each other to see who could, you know, excavate and smuggle artifacts out of Egypt faster. Um, They're both kind of scoundrels in that way. Um, but nobody knew what the hieroglyphs meant. And this stone was found, and what it is is actually um, a declaration that had been passed about um, the Pharaoh Ptolemy V, and it was in three languages. It was in Greek, uh, which they understood in the 18th century, and then it was also in hieroglyphs, which they did not, and demotics, which were a form of like cursive of hieroglyphs. And because of the nature of hieroglyphs, which I will talk about uh, again a bit later. Uh, it took a very long time to decipher the stone. It took about 30 years. So in any case, very important find and very key to helping us understand ancient Egypt. So what you're looking at here, uh, this particular funerary text is known as the Book of the Dead in Common Parlance, and I do not like that term because it was thought of by one of those scoundrels. It was thought of by a guy named Wallace Budge, who was smuggling, smuggling, he like, even after the Egyptian government told him stop taking our stuff he actually created tunnels underneath uh, the pyramids and things so that he could smuggle things out of Egypt and into England so he's a creep um, but he called all of these very diverse texts that were written on tomb walls on coffins and papyrus scrolls um, he referred to them as the book of the dead they're actually that is such a misnomer there was never ever a book of the dead. Uh, you could what they, we really call them are funerary texts, and the Egyptians themselves referred it to um, it as the um, the text of coming forth by day. And it, what it was was instructions for the deceased soul on how to navigate the afterlife. So what you're looking at in this papyrus scroll here is um, the weighing of the heart ceremony. I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit later. What you need to know for right now is in the beginning, only the king, um, starting out, you know, early dynastic culture, he would have the funerary texts on the walls of his coffin. And then shortly after that, they started doing it for members of the court, the queens, the important people, and so forth. Uh, and then in the Middle Kingdom, um, people, private individuals, uh, would have wooden coffins, and the insides and the outsides of their coffins would have the funerary texts on them. And then from Hatshepsut's reign onward, though that's the New Kingdom, that's the 18th dynasty, um, all these texts were written on papyrus um, for people who couldn't afford lavish tombs to have, you know, the stuff on their walls. You'd write it on uh, a nice papyrus scroll and tuck it into the coffin and hope for the best. So uh, let's move on. So Egyptian religion. So in the Near East at this time, we have polytheists. Uh, everybody worshipped multiple gods, 
and gods were manifest uh, in every aspect of nature. They might represent uh, forces of nature, they might uh, represent different types of um, people, and they would influence human lives and order the universe. And for the ancient Egyptians, as we saw in the little thing I sent you guys earlier, um, they could appear in animal or human form or as various combinations of human and animals. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, what you're looking at now is um, Sekhmet. I actually have my own little um, statue of Sekhmet, if you can barely see her here. Um, she was a lioness goddess. Um, she was actually a goddess of war, and it's thought we'll, we'll be talking a lot about the Egypt-Nubia connection later, but uh, it's thought that Sekhmet might have actually come from Nubia. So that's Sekhmet. And they had spheres that could overlap. As I said, they often created compound deities. Um, some gods could have multiple aspects, like Horus the child, that represents the potential power of a child, and Horus in the horizon, denoting the power of daybreak or sunset. And uh, I'm going to kind of skip through this a little bit because I talked a little bit about the chronology of ancient Egypt. I'll let you guys read that on your own. Uh, one thing that we will talk about is the concept of kingship. So they believed... Uh, if you've studied your ancient history and politics and so forth, there was a time uh, when most people thought that kings and rulers were divinely um, sent to rule. Um, this would be a disaster today. Imagine if um, Donald Trump thought that God said, well, not only... Not only are you ruling, but uh, you're also part of me. You too are a god. I guess he already kind of thinks that. But that is how they thought about gods in ancient Egypt. Um, kings were considered gods rather than just intermediaries to the gods. And they ruled according to a principle known as Ma'at, which was um, divinely established by Ma'at. She was a goddess of truth and orderly conduct as well. And order was very important to them and the king represented order. Um, so Amun-Ra, he was a compound god of um, the sun gods Amun and Ra, and he was believed to impregnate the king with a son who would then be heir to the throne. And then the queen, this is the part where uh, Egyptian history makes you go, ooh, um, a queen could be either the king's mother uh, or his sister, uh, yeah, uh, they married their siblings. This causes problems, as you might imagine. Uh, they didn't quite know quite the things about genetics that we know today, but we'll, we'll get into that later. Um, and generally, generally, Egyptian women did not become pharaohs themselves, but there are a few notable uh, exceptions to this general rule, and we'll get into that in a bit. Um, the queen was the king's means of renewal by giving him heirs to the throne um, or daughters with whom he would create alliances with other kingdoms. So what was the purpose of art in ancient Egypt? So from our book, we have images of the dead ensured their survival in the next world and formed a point of contact between the realms of the living and the dead, where the dead could receive the offerings brought by the living. So basically, um, the Egyptians believed that image and word were both magic. So whatever you wrote down would happen uh, images could come to life and make things happen. And so the idea was uh, in the tombs we, we have, and we'll be looking at tons and tons of these, uh, images known as um, offering tablets, where you have rows and rows of people making offerings. And it was, and that part of that is part of the sustenance of the soul in the afterlife. And your family, after you pass in ancient Egypt, was supposed to, um, you know, keep making offerings to keep your soul going in the afterlife. But the idea was, if for some reason your family could not um, make the journey to your tomb to make the offerings, then these images would come to life and they would make the offerings. So we see people in these images, they're doing all kinds of things. They're making bread, they're making beer, um, they're going fishing, they're doing all kinds of things. So this is the idea that image comes to life. Image and word are magic. So this is the uh, east wall of the tomb of the chapel of Kanum Hotep at Beni Hassan. And this is looking into the shrine. Um, basically, if you see that little doorway there, um, I can't point to it 
because it doesn't quite look right to you. But uh, if you look through that door there, um, that would have at one time had a rock cut statue of the deceased. Uh, as I mentioned the other day, most of the tombs have been raided since antiquity. A lot of these statues are now missing. Um, but then to the left of the doorway, uh, actually to the left and right, you can see on both sides, Kanum Hotep is in the marshes. He's hunting birds with a throw stick. Uh, and this gives you the setting for performing the funerary cult for the dead deceased owner and the ritual was centered on the statue in that shrine um, believing that the ka the soul of the deceased would manifest there in order to benefit from the presentation of offerings and since the king and his uh, officials commanded the most resources in ancient Egypt, it follows, too, that they would have had access to the best artists, artists who had the skills to produce uh, in the best possible way the things that their patrons would have desired. So the monuments produced by these artists appeal to us today because they're so beautiful. Um, they're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and people of lesser rank would not get access to these first-class artists. Uh, they would have to accept work from second-rate uh, talents, although as you can see here, this is from the tomb of Tai, who was a commoner in the 5th dynasty, and looks pretty good to me. And uh, so, of course, people love looking at the art. That's what people um, find so appealing. So I'm going to keep going here. So um, the way that Egyptians perceived the world was influenced, as I mentioned, by their geographical um, environment. So that Nile River was very important. The Delta was very important. And when you look at uh, images of Egypt nowadays um, that they can take from the sky, you know, you have this great big um, desert with this little green rib um, ribbon coming down. So the, it's the river Nile that allows people to live and so it was everything to them it was so important to them and uh, so I talked about Kemet and Desharet earlier and here we have the image uh, representing um, Desharet and Kemet when you see this this represents the papyrus plant and the lotus and when they are shown together united like this uh, it shows the union of ancient Egypt uh, it's not just a pretty picture, it's also a hieroglyph representing that. Um, we also see here the pharaoh standing between two goddesses, probably Isis and her sister Nephthys. And you'll see each one of them is wearing a different headdress, the goddesses, but on the king's head they are combined. So on the left um, we have the red crown of um, uh, Lower Egypt, on the right the white crown of Upper Egypt. So when they're put together on the Pharaoh's head, it's showing that he's united the land and he has also beat the cosmic struggle between the forces of order and the forces of chaos. Very, very important. And uh, one of their several different creation myths um, that the Egyptians followed um, at the time of creation, the ordered world was brought into being. And so before that, there was nothing ordered. Um, we only had these primordial uh, waters called none, and you see that kind of in the Christian Bible, where they talk about, you know, the Spirit of God was upon the waters, but all was silent. Similar idea. So um, none is what the Egyptians called this, and they saw it as chaos. So out of the waters, a mound arose. Ooh. And so just as the Egyptians would have observed muddy mounds arising out of the Nile each year as the flood retreated. And it was on this mound that the creator God came into being of himself. He gave birth to himself. Um, and we're not really sure exactly how he did that. Some people say he had sex with himself and brought forth the first divine couple, Shu and Tefnut. Um, they are breath and moisture. And then Shu and Tefnut in turn gave birth to Geb, who represents the earth, and Nut, who represents the sky. And then there's a long story in between that, but long story short, the two of them gave birth to two sets of twins, Osiris, Isis, 
set and Nephthys, and we will talk about all of that a bit later. But this particular group of deities is known as the Ennead, the group of nine. Um, and we have Horus down there at the bottom because Osiris and Isis later give birth to him, but that's that's later. Let's just keep going because it's complicated. Um, Osiris, for people, represented the ordered world. Um, some people think he was actually an historic king of ancient Egypt who actually ruled Egypt and brought the benefits of civilization to the country. Could be. I, you know, a myth is um, ancient people's way of talking about how things came to be. So sometimes... Um, you know, people get mythologized and, you know, they achieve godhood by myth mythologizing. So Set, by contrast, was the antithesis of order. Um, his birth from his moot had been irregular and he caused the death of Osiris, long story, because um, he wanted to try to claim Egypt for himself. Lots of stories all about this. We will talk all about them later. Uh, and then uh, after he died, okay, we, I said we were going to talk about this later. Osiris is brought back to life by Isis. I'll talk to talk to you all about that later. Let's move on and see what else we need to know from here. I'm going to let you guys read some of this. Um, one thing you do need to know is every king of Egypt was identified with Horus, the young, um, young prince, young god, during his lifetime, and then Osiris after his death. Um, Osiris, after Set killed him, came to life long enough um, by the um, powers of his wife Isis for her to get pregnant and conceive Horus, and after that he goes into the afterworld and becomes, becomes king of the afterworld. So in that way, the living king of Egypt then can kind of fit into the mythos if you will. So the king is considered to be the mediator between the divine and the human worlds and by building and decorating temples uh, or by commissioning furnishings and items to be used in uh, his own cult and the cult of the gods, he's engaging in acts of creation that strengthen order and banish chaos. All of that over and over. Uh, let me see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on. Okay. Yeah, I talked about Egypt, the two lands, the valley, the delta. Oh, one of the king's most important titles was Nesut Bidi. Um, that's usually translated as the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. And I talked about the crowns. Here's a nice illustration. Um, the Peshent crown is the crown that represents the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. There are lots of other crowns uh, in uh, ancient Egypt. And then each of the two areas of ancient Egypt also had its own goddess and its own heraldic plant. Um, we have the vulture goddess Nekebet and the lily, I'm sorry, not um, the lotus, the lily for upper, upper Egypt and the cobra goddess Wajet and the papyrus plant for lower Egypt. So here on a um, Uraeus. The Uraeus is where they appear on the crown together. We see it on King Tut's um, headpiece there. And then when you see the stems of the plants knotted together, that means union, semitawi, the union of the two lands. So it was in the single person of the king of Egypt that the duality of Egypt is bound into one. And here you're looking at... Um, the Temple of Horus at Edfu, and this is showing you, and we'll see this kind of imagery over and over again. The king is um, standing there on both sides of the temple, kind of mirror images on each side of the temple, um, smiting his enemies. And again, that was one of the ways in which the um, the king proclaimed his powers over um, the forces of chaos is by defeating the enemies of Egypt. And here we have again the Sematawi um, motif. I think I say that over and over again. Um, here's an interesting little thing. So um, a, a lot of times the actual hieroglyphs get worked into uh, the artwork that we see. So we're looking at a Ka statue, and the Ka statue, as I think I mentioned earlier, is where 
uh, one of the parts of the soul would reside, reside. The Egyptians actually believed that the soul was made up of multiple parts, but um, the ka is one of those, and it's the force that can go into the statues and receive offerings. And the symbol for the ka is two arms joined together. And so on this ka statue, we've actually got, in case you miss it, you've got, actually got the symbol for ka sitting on the guy's heads. Uh, and so the king was considered to be um, similar to, but not identical uh, to the gods. Nefer means God, and one of his titles is Netcher Nefer, which means perfect God. And uh, this goes on and on and on and on. I'm not going to read that, but what I am going to talk about, so let's go back for a moment. Look at, this is the king. He's actually a pretty stiff looking figure there. Um, if we were looking at the whole figure, which we will later, um, this king always looks really stiff. Let's look again at um, this statue here of Sekhmet. This is a lot um, of the way in which pharaohs would be shown in that they um, always have their arms very stiffly by their sides. Um, even sometimes there's no opening between the arms and the legs. And then you've got this guy here. Um, this is a scribe. He's a lowly scribe, and he is depicted much more uh, lifelike. He is shown as an older individual. His flesh is actually sagging. He's fully three-dimensional. There are spaces between his arms. He looks as though he's about to take action. He's about to write something down. So some principles of Egyptian art. So some people are like, what? Did they just not understand what the Greeks were doing? Which basically means they didn't have a sculpture in which the body turned and twisted through space like classical Greek statuary. Um, let's, let's just look at this. So um, what we have, uh, one of the common elements is frontality. Um, they, the most important thing, you could look at it from the back, but everything's from the front. Again, um, here we have, uh, I have another statue here of um, Horus. Uh, you can also see it from the side. The back is just not that interesting. So frontality, everybody faced straight ahead. They don't twist or turn. Um, it's not really for a decorative event effect. It's not for um, to create the illusion of actual human beings. The idea is they are playing a role in the cult of the gods, of the king, and the dead. They're places where the beings can manifest themselves to be the recipient of ritual actions. Hence, they are always facing front, almost always, for statues. Um, and other statues might be designed to be placed within an architectural setting. Um, these guys are falling down quite a lot, but here you can see they're in front of um, a pylon temple um, or pillared courts um, where they might be placed against or between uh, pillars. Uh, and within the architectural context, that frontality would still hold. And here's a really good one where you can see um, the king is literally joined with the stone there. So normally statues are made of stone, wood, or metal. Um, stone statues would be um, worked from rectangular blocks of material. And as I said, it looks like he's still there, like in the thing. Um, but it also is meant to give the image a sense of strength and power. And then wooden statues um, were carved from several pieces of wood that would be pe pegged together to form the finished work. And you see more of this in the Middle Kingdom, actually. Um, and there's a reason for that, which I will get into a little bit later. There's no back pillar. Um, everything is much freer and lighter. But everything is still frontal, as you can see. And then, uh, as I mentioned, you see people doing all kinds of things. These are people um, making bread. Um, looks like that guy is pounding things in a mortar. He's grinding grain. They're baking bread. They're making pots. Um, all kinds of things that the king would need in order to uh, continue in the afterlife there. So, uh, and these were made exclusively for um, the elite people, of course, and they are not limited to standing, sitting, and kneeling. Instead, these are fully three-dimensional. They're shown, you know, fully able to carry out the tasks that are needed by the king. Uh, let's see. 
see if there's any. I'm going to be talking about this slide actually in another slideshow. Again, I'm going to let you guys read a lot of this on your own. But the one thing that we do see um, in ancient Egypt too is the head is almost always shown in profile with a full view eyebrow and an eye sent into it. And then the shoulders um, are most frequently depicted full view, but then the waist, buttocks, and limbs are in profile, as you can see here. Uh, and then the nipple on male fig figures and the breast on female ones are drawn in profile on the front line of the body. And then children are itty, 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 bitty. Um, even if at the time of the deceased passing away, um, your children are adults, they are depicted as small in the tomb um, because that way people know, well, those are the children. And also here they talk about um, up until the 18th dynasty, um, your two feet are rendered identically from the inside, showing the big toe and the arch. And then after that time, the near foot was increasingly rendered from the outside with all the toes showing. Why did this happen? We don't know. Um, this is the kind of thing that art historians make a big deal out of. And um, <sighs> there'll probably be a lot of discussion about this in your book. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that we see is we have these representations um, written with text, combining in text, and we also see what we call registers in art history. And a register is basically a horizontal band of images. And so in this image, so you've got the top register, you've got one, two, three, four, five, almost six registers here. So we'll talk about, you know, this is happening in this register and this is happening in the third register and so forth. And then longer texts would include requests um, for offerings for the dead. So these are known as offering formulas. Um, you'd also have hymns, uh, to the deities, words spoken by deities to the king, uh, and the text within any given scene is very important um, to the whole composition. Um, blocks of hieroglyphs will be set against representational image uh, elements so that without the hieroglyphs, the composition would actually not be balanced. Take away um, the hieroglyphs and it doesn't make sense. Another interesting thing that happens, uh, I don't know if that's in the slideshow or not, but you also get human figures um, spelling out the hieroglyphs or enacting the hieroglyphs, which is kind of cool. Uh, and then there's a whole thing here about uh, the hieroglyphs. Um, so here, here's the thing about hieroglyphs. Um, they don't necessarily represent the object they depict. Instead, they represent phonetic sounds, and that's part of why it was so hard for them to be uh, decoded. And then others are logographic. Basically, they literally stand for an object or an idea. Again, that's really hard to translate if you're used to looking at, well, this is the letter A, this is the letter B be, so forth and so on. Um, and then further, um, they can also act as determinatives. In other words, there's a hieroglyph for goddess. So you know that the name is the name of a goddess rather than um, a queen or an ordinary person. So all of these things go into um, having made the decoding of the hieroglyphs very difficult. Um, so there's hundreds of them. Uh, and then the primary orientation for two-dimensional art um, for both hieroglyphs and figures is to face to the viewer's right. However, you could review, reverse them to face left, and a lot of times you see them um, on mirrored images on sides of tombs. And also they can be written horizontally or vertically, um, up and down and so forth. Reversals weren't done at random. They were usually done to carry some kind of meaning. Uh, and here we have the Sematawi um, hieroglyph actually created into um, a beautiful vase here. Um, so that's really cool too. This is from the tomb of uh, King Tutankhamun and it's composed almost entirely of hieroglyphic signs placed together. So um, 
you see the onk at the bottom there for life uh, and the crosswords um, so the onks each have little arms at the bottom there kind of cute little arms um, they're each holding the hieroglyph that represents dominion so the onk is for life um, the waz sign that they're gripping means dominion and then it also has the rempet sign for years and then the lily or the sedge plant of upper Egypt the papyrus of lower Egypt have the semitau sign for union um, so all of this the whole thing gives us a message having to do with underlying continuous support of the powers of life and dominion to the United Kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt and we will see this again and again for centuries throughout um, Egyptian art and it's it's beautiful and um, elegant in the way that they combine them and then here's an example of how human figures uh, actually form um, the hieroglyphs themselves. So this is the Henu hieroglyph, which is for praise. And literally, it represents um, the act of offering praise to a god. So in the middle picture, you've got a scene of jubilation from the tomb of Ramses II, 19th dynasty and it's showing the rejuvenation of the king's ba which is another part of the soul and so the written henu um, hieroglyph is visible in the little inscription above um, the figure next to the king who happens to be anubis and it's clearly mirrored in the larger figures of the representation so the figures are simply hieroglyphs made large and then personified creatures of symbolic importance such as the reket bird in the illustration to the right, or even personified hieroglyphs such as the Waz was shown in the Henu position. Uh, again, as you can see in that image on the right, it's kind of cute. Uh, in the latter, the forked base of the scepter is used to represent human legs, and then the human artist has uh, added arms, um, which the Waz has made to form the gesture of praise. And then we also have the eyes of um, the falcon god of horse. I got to talk to you guys about this because somebody in one of my classes a long time ago, I have no idea where this came from, but I need to address it because she said, it's the third eye. It's the third eye. I have no idea what that meant at all. Um, what I know comes from my studies of ancient Egypt. Um, it's nothing weird. It doesn't represent the Illuminati. Please, okay, you know, this is like real college and an academic course. So I'm going to talk about what this eye really means. Now, people may have taken it and adopted it to mean things other than the original meaning, but for the purposes of this course, it is not the Illuminati. Okay, um, it's the eye of Horus and actually the eye of Ra. So from very early times, the sun and moon were regarded as the eyes of Horus. And the two eyes were eventually differentiated with the left eye being the symbol of the moon and or the right eye being the symbol of the moon and the left eye being that of the sun. So, in an ornate pectoral from the treasure of Tutankhamun depicts the right or solar eye, um, while another depicts the left eye beneath a lunar orb. Um, so, yeah, I've got them facing opposite there, so you can actually see them. So, um, there's a mythological story that tells how the Eye of Horus was damaged and then healed, uh, and that reflects the waning and waxing of the new moon, and the name Wedjat was given to this symbol to mean the whole or restored one. And the composition of the symbol itself is not completely understood, um, but we think it's meant to represent the markings um, that you would see on the cheek of a falcon, since Horus was the falcon god. So what kinds of materials did the Egyptian artists use? Well, all kinds of things. Um, limestone was very um, readily available and plentiful um, in ancient Egypt in the Nile Valley. And then other fairly soft stones uh, would be things like calcite, which is a crystalline form of calcium carbonate, also sandstone schist, granite, basalt, um, stone was a major building material for freestanding and rock cut tombs, and it was used to make statues, stelae, libation bowls, vessels, and other ritual equipment. 
And soft stones, um, this actually, I believe this was limestone, these two statues here. We'll talk about them later. But generally, as you can see, these were covered with a thin layer of plaster and then painted. And a lot of the paint, uh, depending on the stone, if the stone wasn't porous, the paint has sent since come off but um, in a porous stone like um, limestone it tends to get soaked in which is what happened here and so um, that's very interesting and then sometimes um, the color of a stone that you might not apply paint to would be chosen for its symbolism. Um, black stones like granodiorite <laughs> refer to the life-giving black silt um, brought by the Nile inundation. Ta-da! Um, they also symbolize new life, resurrection, and the resurrected god of the dead, Osiris, who, as you see here, he's often shown with black skin. Sometimes he's also green because he was also um, the god of introducing agriculture to the Egyptians. So we have a range of colors, red, brown, yellow, gold, uh, associated with the sun. So the stones of those colors, like um, red and brown quartzite and red granite, uh, would have a solar symbolism. Similarly, uh, where you see carnelian, carnelian is red, um, that would have a solar symbolism. Um, green stones refer to fresh growing vegetation, as I said, and Osiris. And again, we see him sometimes with green skin. And sometimes statues would be made of wood um, and stone, and there is a long um, a long tradition of woodworking in Egypt. They would use things like tamarisk, acacia, sycamore, um, and maybe sometimes wood brought, imported from Syria. So I'm going to just kind of move on here. Um, as I mentioned the other day, the ancient Egyptians believed that the skin of the gods uh, was gold, so they used gold a lot on things. Again, I'm going to let you guys read a lot of this on your own. Um, important thing, they created a material that they call faience, which is basically a glaze um, for ceramics. It's made from a quartz core covered on the surface with a glaze, and then they would model and mold it, and it was not costly. So um, they also liked to do um, like a glaze paste um, to substitute for real stones in some cases so that it would be less expensive. But faience, you'll see a lot of um, like the image on that disc there to the left, a lot of that blue color, that really beautiful turquoise blue on a lot of things and that is referred to as faience blue. Yeah, and there it would be, <laughs> linked to the goddess Hathor, often known as Lady of the Turquoise. And um, the root word was chehen, which means to dazzle or gleam. So the word for faience was to jehenet, um, which was associated with the sun. And again, everything goes back to the sun in ancient Egypt. Uh, and then limestone uh, would be, and other soft stones would be carved with copper chisels and tools. Going to let you guys read that on your own. Um, important thing to talk about reliefs. So relief is a, kind of a type of sculpture. It's kind of, sort of dimensional, um, three-dimensional, almost sort of. Um, basically what you have with relief, so here we have a scene on a stone surface that would be cut into relief and then often would be painted after that. And there's two types of relief. Raised relief, which you're looking at here, where it looks as though um, the figures are coming out from the stone. That's raised relief. And then there's sunk relief, where the opposite it true, is true. They're going into the stone, and they each have particular um, purposes. So um, in both, chisels were used to cut around the outlines of figures. And then in raised relief, the stone of the background is cut away, so the figures stand out from the surface. So that is what you see here. This is a raised relief. 
And then this is a sunk relief. Um, so the figures are cut back within their outlines, leaving the surface of the background at a higher level. And then finally, in both types of relief, the figures would be modeled to a greater or lesser extent um, within their outlines. So, and there's a whole purpose behind this. So sunk relief was used on the outside walls. This is important. And raised relief is on interior ones. So the bright sunlight has the effect of flattening raised relief and enhancing sunken relief because of the shadows which you can kind of see in this slide right here and then before the stone was painted the surface had to be smoothed and any holes had to be filled in with plaster and in painting as opposed to relief cut um, Theban tombs, the rock cut walls were covered with a layer of mud that would be plastered. Um, but what's really important here for you guys to notice is you can see lines in this image. And frequently what would happen in the tool tombs is the scenes would first be um, laid out by marking off the area to be decorated. And then um, there would be a draftsman to go in to go in and create a grid and there was a particular canon of proportions that they had to follow so then um, the areas would be marked off the initial sketches would be made in red and then corrections would be made in black and we know this from looking at unfinished tombs actually some of them were left unfinished and then square grids were introduced at the beginning of the middle kingdom um, often drawn against a straight edge um, and made with a string that would be dipped in paint and then tapped against the surface so you get a perfectly straight line. And these are actually ancient brushes that were found uh, in a worker's tomb. They were drawn with brushes similar to the ones used by scribes. They were made from reeds that were trimmed at one end to an angle and then either chewed or split to fray the fibers so that they would spread. So here you can see a scribe's palette and brushes and the paint would be laid on in flat washes, basically meaning water plus pigment, pigment by pigment. So the painters mixed as much of one color as they would need, paint in all the appropriate areas, then move on to the next color. And then for um, that purpose, they would use thicker brushes made from fibrous woods like palm ribs um, or bundles of twigs that would be tied together um, and beaten at one end to separate the fibers and make a kind of uh, coarse brush. And then the final stage of painting was to outline the figures and add interior details with a fine brush. Many details in relief work and on statues were often only uh, added in paint, not even cut into the stone. And then in addition to that, um, stone, linen, etc., could be plastered and painted uh, to make decorated funerary and votive cloths. Um, alternating layers of linen and plaster could be built up to form something called cartonnage. So for ordinary people that were not kings, weren't getting buried in, uh, you know, tombs with gold masks, you would have a painted funeral mask uh, and also mummy trappings and so forth. And then we talked a little bit about papyrus before. So here you can see uh, an image of what the actual plant looks like. And that was the ancient Egyptian equivalent of paper. And it was used um, for all kinds of things, writing surface for everything, administrative work, economic, literary, ritual documents, um, and also in the production of the funerary text that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the, yeah. And uh, we can get glimpses into the working lives of the artists uh, in documents that were found at Deir el Medina, which was a village that housed workmen who worked on the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, and the state actually provide these art, provided these artists with this town to live in and their families to live in. And then they would also have all the tools and supplies that we would, they would need for the work on the tomb. And there's actually a letter that survives from one of the workmen who lived in the time of Ramses II. So this evidence, together with scenes in private tomb chapels of the old, middle, and new kingdom, um, show sculptors' workshops and other types of production, um, showing that artists worked in teams 
Um, uh, the other thing that this does is it kind of clears up the idea um, that most of the tombs in ancient Egypt were created by slaves. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later because Ramses II is thought to be the pharaoh, who was the pharaoh at the time of uh, Moses, and it's very likely that he did in fact employ slaves, or not employ them, it forced slaves to work because, um, well, he built a lot of stuff, and he was uh, kind of ego crazy and uh, loved his own image. Oh, for Pete's sake, this happened before... Okay, there we go. I'm back. Okay, so in any case, um, the one thing that we have is the idea that um, there's not a lot of individualism. Um, artists would um, do what they were told to do and create the images that they were told to create. Um, it was more about craftsmanship than individuality and creativity at this particular time in history. Um, so we'll see that uh, many of the fundamentals of Egyptian art were established at the very beginning of Egyptian history. They did not change a lot after that time, um, and the subject matter re remained the same pretty much over long periods of time. Um, it did not remain uh, virtually the same for 3,000 years, um, and there is some variation. Um, we're going to talk about all that as the uh, course winds on. So I thank you for your patience with me. And with this uh, slideshow, I am going to uh, end the recording now and see you in Chapter 2.